a lifetime of killing off those bacteria by a lack of fiber means that a, a significant percentage of the population is now deficient and, and incapable of making hydrogen. So I want to start with a bit of your background. Uh, you got a mystery virus that left you absolutely miserable. Tell us about that first, and then let's get into hydrogen. This is about 10 years ago, and um, at the time I was the fittest and healthiest I'd ever been in my life. Um, the business I was running, I was on the road about a week a month, and the other three weeks I only had an hour, hour or two of work to do at home a day. Um, so I was training four to six hours a day between martial arts, CrossFit, just being generally active. And whatever hit me, it absolutely floored me. Overnight, I had central nervous system fatigue, so I couldn't jump an inch off the ground. I couldn't do any explosive movements at all. Um, I had sudden onset narcolepsy. So if I sat down in the chair like this and wasn't animated talking for a minute or so, I'd just conk out, fall asleep. I was sleeping 16 to 18 hours a day. You lucky devil. <laughs> <laughs> um, my C-reactive proteins were like 35 milligrams a deciliter. Wow. So I was yeah, you know, so. 100 times abnormal, yeah. 70 to 100 times abnormal. And uh, they just really couldn't figure it out. At the same time, my, my best friend, they thought he had the same virus, but it was completely different with him. Uh, he kept on having to go to the hospital. Um, he had pneumonia, had to miss work for a couple weeks. So something really hit us. Um, then when the dust settled and, you know, my inflammation dropped, not even to normal, but just down to like two milligrams a deciliter, um, I was left with osteoarthritis in 11 joints. Right, the worst of which is my left shoulder. It's completely bone on bone now. The doctors I was dealing with told me that I can never work out again, you know, have to basically just uh, protect my joints at all costs. And I didn't like that answer. So they had put me on a thousand milligrams of naproxen a day and I was doing cortisone injections. And uh, I just knew those weren't long-term solutions, especially being 29 at the time. I can't just be on high levels of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for the rest of my life. Yeah, for those listening, that's a leave, a super leave. How's that? Yeah, like five times what you take yeah. in a leave. I spent all that time I, I'd been training just scouring PubMed, reading every single article I could find on anything that could regulate the inflammatory response in the body. And I started a bunch of different protocols, one of which I'd found some research on hydrogen water and molecular hydrogen. There was a dearth of options to get hydrogen water at the time, but I bought a machine for four or five thousand dollars and yeah. was supposed to make it. And I was back to exercising, but not like I had before. Um, you know, maybe five times a week, an hour a day. And nine or so months later, I fainted a couple different times like within a week or so at the gym. And it turns out I developed multiple ulcers from the, the super elite, <laughs> as you call it. And I had to abruptly stop, you know, taking the, the anti-inflammatory drugs. Well, within a couple of days of stopping, all of my joints seized. So I couldn't put on a shirt, couldn't put on socks because, you know, I, I have bad arthritis in my hip too. And it just left me floored and back to the drawing board because I realized other than the drugs, none of these protocols I was on was actually significantly helping me because I'd seized up, um, including the hydrogen water that I'd spent like $5,000 in the machine. So I went back to PubMed and started diving back in and there were more newer articles showing hydrogen water had these effects. And it, it perturbed me, but I decided to buy the full studies to read the materials and methods and realized that none of the studies were using a machine like what I'd bought, uh -huh. right? And then I just thought to myself, how do I even know that this machine is making hydrogen water? Because I was just going off what the salesman told me, right? Makes sense. So I found a chemical reagent to test for hydrogen and do the titration, and it was undetectable. When I tripled the input, I was able to reduce one drop indicating that there was only 0.03 parts per million of hydrogen coming out of this machine. And that's nothing, it's, right? It's nothing. Okay. It is right. 1 16th, 1 17th of the lowest 
concentration that is ever shown to have any physiological effect. And of course, hydrogen is like any other molecule. There's a dose-dependent effect. And so far to date, there's no instance where getting a higher concentration and dose is less effective than a lower dose, right? Okay. Um, and a lot of the research, like on my technology, we're getting in half a liter over 12 parts per million. So hundreds of times higher than what this machine was spinning. That actually gave me a bit of hope because um, I realized I hadn't actually tried hydrogen yet. So I started doing some um, home chemistry and making some concoctions. I, I'd gotten sources on the magnesium I need to make this and was buying some organic acids. And I was testing my home concoctions at about 3 ppm, you know, and I was drinking a few liters a day of this. And within about a week, my joints started loosening. I was thinking, wow, this is really working. And, uh, but I did have a, a sober second thought. And I thought to myself, I'm a quick learner and I understand the basic chemistry, but I don't want to win a Darwin Award. I'm dealing with elemental magnesium and hydrogen gas in my kitchen. I don't want to blow myself up in my house and <laughs> have you, a disaster. You don't want to be the Hindenburg. Exactly. So I found my founding partner. Um, he's a, a PhD in uh, organic chemistry. He's in the pharmaceutical industry. He develops molecules for drug research. Um, at first, he told me it was the worst pseudoscience he'd ever heard in his life. And he gave me this list of all the reasons why you can't dissolve hydrogen in water. Even if you could, it's not going to have a physiological effect. It's inert. Um, by that time, I'd read enough papers that I was able to rebut him with peer-reviewed research in every area and he gave it a read and uh, he said I'm, I'm stunned but it appears there's something here sure I'll take a look at what you're doing mm -hmm. and uh, as he was reviewing my chemistry and uh, what I'd been uh, doing with this I just kept on sending him a new paper every day and uh, he called me up um, and asked me for lunch and serendipitously, I'd sent him a paper. It was a human double-blind placebo-controlled trial on a model that he was the lead chemist developing small molecules to target. Hmm. And he said, the other research you've sent, I'm not a, an, a subject matter expert, right? So I just have to go off the conclusions. But unless this paper is fraudulent, this stuff works. Are you sure you just want this as a do-it-yourself project? Or are you looking for a partner? Do you want to go into commercialization? We talked about it a lot, um, decided to give it a try. And uh, refining my chemistry didn't take that long. Um, it was only a couple of weeks, but we quickly realized it was a massive difference between making 20 of them in a mortar and pestle and pressing by hand and having the reaction work the same way, making millions at high speed. And so that took us about a year a few thousand iterative adjustments to our formulation yeah. and 15 failed scale-up attempts. But uh, finally, we got our first production-ready tablet out. We stopped tra counting, but at least 5,000 more iterative adjustments to continuously improve the, the product. So let's back up because your, your investor or your partner says, you know, oh, come on, this is pseudoscience. Yeah. And... You know, I'm glad it's having a placebo effect on you. You go, well, wait a minute. There's like a thousand papers uh, written about this, primarily in Japan and China. Uh, so why would hydrogen have any effect on what you're what you're saying it, it does? Yeah, um, absolutely. And this is something that... Uh, um, evaded researchers and, and why is hydrogen having this, this physiological effect? Like we're seeing it replicated over and over again in many, many different models, right? But why, right? What's the evolutionary basis? Right. And as research on hydrogen expanded and, and more experts from other fields started looking, the story started coming together more. For instance, hydrogen has been with us since the dawn of evolution. So our mitochondria evolved from eukaryotes, and eukaryotes expelled hydrogen gas as a waste product. Eukaryotes formed from a symbiotic relationship between two organelles, one of which consumed hydrogen, right, as a fuel source. Right. So hydrogen has been with our mitochondria since before it was mitochondria. 
And we know that hydrogen is having an impact primarily on the mitochondria. It's being called a mitohormetic effector. So hormesis for the mitochondria or like exercise like stress for the mitochondria. It's improving the mitochondria's function, their number through mitochondrial biogenesis, repairing damaged mitochondria. So it's having the, these profound effects on our mitochondria. We know that there has been more hydrogen in our atmosphere at various times throughout evolution. In fact, the oldest waters we found on the planet um, two billion years old, deep beneath the Canadian Shield, still has dissolved hydrogen gas in those sources. But more importantly, um, we, we now know why supplementing with exogenous hydrogen, external hydrogen, it is going to be impactful because we, we produce it endogenously. So why do we need more of it? Let me stop you there. Yeah, sure. Well, wait a minute. We produce it. Who's, who's making it for us? The bacteria mm. in, our, in our stomach, except for people who have impaired microbiomes, which is a shocking amount. So research is showing that uh, once you hit middle age, especially people with uh, impaired metabolisms or who are overweight, um, they stop producing hydrogen gas. They're producing methane instead in, in rates of 60 to 80 percent you know, of middle-aged people are producing methane instead of H2. In addition to that, um, the way we're producing hydrogen with our bacteria is by fermenting non-nutritive carbohydrates or fibers. Right. Right. And historically, humans would have consumed 100 to 150 grams of dietary fiber a day. True. Today, the average person on a Western diet, or in the Western world, rather, um, consumes like less than 15 grams. But someone on a standard American diet eating a lot of fast food might consume only one or two or three grams of dietary fiber a day. So what is likely happening is because we're not actually consuming the fuel source for the bacteria that makes the hydrogen, we're losing those bacteria. Right. They got nothing to eat. Exactly. And they leave. <laughs> exactly. So even if you start eating fiber now, if you lack that bacteria, you're not going to just start producing hydrogen all of a sudden. So right. a lifetime of killing off those bacteria by a lack of fiber means that a, a significant percentage of the population is now deficient and, and incapable of making hydrogen. One of the things that got me interested about hydrogen water years ago was a Japanese study looking at people with uh, early Parkinson's, mm -hmm. uh, a neurodegenerative yeah. disease, which there's an epidemic of like Alzheimer's. And they found that the people with early Parkinson's did not have bacteria in their gut that produced hydrogen gas, yeah. whereas the control group that didn't have Parkinson, lo and behold, had bacteria that made hydrogen gas. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but they gave these individuals hydrogen water, which is what we're talking about today, hydrogen gas dissolved in water, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, their symptoms improved. This has been true in a few studies in rodents and humans. Um, there are studies that have shown uh, no effect in hydrogen water and PD, but a lot more research is needed right, right on, on this subject. And even the, the, the one that showed uh, uh, no effect, there, there was a, a massive error in the study, and a percentage of the placebo group were actually getting Oops. Hydrogen water. It's a tough area. Um, we had a trial um, that was supposed to be ongoing um, in, in a major university in the U.S. here, but uh, they canceled it during the pandemic because they weren't able to recruit anyone. So that uh, it, it's something I'd love to see more research on. I think you're right. Uh, the uh, there's a husband and wife microbiome research team at Stanford, the Sonnenbergs, who would absolutely confirm what you're saying is unfortunately primarily because of our diet but also in the things i talk about the antibiotics that we take yeah. the antibiotics that we feed our animals that we mm -hmm. eat we're a desert wasteland of a microbiome now compared to some hunter gatherer in oh, africa uh, yeah and I'm, I'm sure you're aware too like a lot of people think you can just take you know a probiotic and fix everything but some of the bacteria that we lose, we can get back within weeks. Some might take years. And we've, as you mentioned, the hunter-gatherers, there's bacteria in hunter-gatherer populations that we believe took generations to lose, 
right? So yeah. it's not just a simple fix. Well, and again, I tell people that, you know, we live in California and we're used to forest fires now, unfortunately. And when that forest, which is a amazing ecosystem, burns to the ground, we think that we can put some little seedlings in <laughs> and instantly have a forest, but it'll take 20 or 30 years to get that complex ecosystem back. Yep. And yet we assume that when we take a round of antibiotics for a cold, which of course it doesn't work on anyhow, we can take a probiotic and presto changeo, we'll get the ecosystem back. I wish it was that simple. Even if it was, that would still require people to scale back up to eating the 100 to 150 grams of dietary fiber a day that we evolved to anticipate, which that would cause most people severe distress, right? Uh, even me, as I started diving into this, and I slowly scaled up my dietary fiber to 60 to 80 grams a day, and that was months of agony in feeling sick before my body became accustomed. Now, describe to feeling sick. What do you mean? Bloating, like bloated, gas? stabbing pains in you know, your stomach. Cramps, yeah. e exactly. You know, now I'm adjusted to it, but it took months. Most people are not going to go through that. And I'm not even at the levels that we right. evolved to anticipate. And anyone who looks at a gorilla uh, who's got a huge amount of muscle mass, sees that massively giant stomach, <laughs> and that's not fat. That, that's, yeah. that's his fermentation bat. And yeah. we unfortunately, um, once upon a time, um, were able to tolerate that sort of fermentation bat. But you're right, it's uh, getting dietary fiber in and becoming tolerant to it is is an interesting process that I have stalked my patients through. Yeah. And you're right, hydrogen is, is fascinating to, to mitochondria because if, you, if you've read my Energy Paradox book or Unlocking the Keto Code, you know that in the mitochondria, what they're basically doing is energizing electrons and moving protons to make ATP. And lo and behold, hydrogen just happens to have one electron to donate and happens to have a proton. So it's a fabulous donor for making energy. And you're right, probably the original life forms were down in the bottom of ocean vents um, where hydrogen was very available. One of the interesting things that we're, we're seeing about hydrogen and how it affects, um, say, energy is with ATP, and, and this is actually true for, for almost everything we're looking at with hydrogen, it, is, uh, it has no effect when everything is fine and healthy and perfect. It's only as soon as there's a stress that hydrogen seems to be like this master supervisor within the cell that ramps up ATP and energy production and starts correcting everything that's going wrong. So for instance, hydrogen won't say drive up ATP when you're, you're feeling great, but uh, if you have a, a TBI or a stress, all of a sudden it, it ramps up to repair that, that damage. Um, we've seen the same thing on, on research with, with the tablets where um, hydrogen is not a stimulant. So if you take it and you're, you're you know, already full of energy, you don't feel a kick in energy. But after acute sleep deprivation, we're seeing like significant increases in brain metabolism and more robust when compared against caffeine, right? Hmm. Head to head research. And that's not a stimulant effect. That's just repairing the decrease in, you know, choline to creatine ratios in the brain that happen from the, you know, sleep deprivation stress. So what you're saying is I can stay up all night and have a couple hydrogen tablets in my water and just keep going, man. <laughs> No, you'll, no, you'll, no. You'll, you'll, you'll feel better for a couple hours, right? Like it doesn't last forever, but uh, we have improved things like the attention network test after 24 hours sleep deprivation. Yeah. And uh, actually hydrogen specifically affected orienting, whereas stimulants like caffeine affect alerting. That's what makes you jittery and looking around and uh, can cause anxiety in some people. But hydrogen, uh, anecdotally, it, it, it doesn't feel like a stimulant. It feels like you're returning to normal right? Like you just feel okay. And that's actually what in the research where it shows that we're, we're improving orienting, that ties into the experiential feeling. All right. So how about uh, exercise tolerance? Where, where does hydrogen fit in there? 
So hydrogen uh, has, uh, you know, uh, one systematic review and meta-analysis showing that there's a significant anti-fatigue effect, right? Now, we have uh, some research that, that is about to publish two actually separate tri trials showing that we uh, significantly um, protect against the rise in, in, like, creatine kinase and damages like, you know, other damages like myoglobin, right? Mm -hmm. So... This is basically protecting uh, against muscle damage post-exercise. But there's even cooler research done in rodents that shows exactly how hydrogen can potentiate the stress response of exercise while helping you recover faster. So, for instance, in, in uh, rats that were um, put on a, a forced swim. Actually, let me stop you there. Sure. Exercise is good for you because it's actually bad for you. Exactly. Okay. Yes. And, it's that, a, and that's a yeah. hormetic effect. Exactly. That which doesn't kill me makes me stronger. It, exactly. So long as it's not too big of a stress. Exactly. Right? That, that and, which doesn't kill me. And that, that's what <laughs> hydrogen is, right? Um, it, it's an adapted stress, something we evolved to anticipate. So our body expects that and it helps with cell signaling and, and restoring a lot of our functions, right? Oh. So. This okay, is what back to the rat, rat study. So the control rats, you know, you, you'd see as expected, you know, a, a rise in oxidative stress and inflammation while they're exercising, right? In the hydrogen group, what, what it was really counterintuitive at first until we started understanding hydrogen better is hydrogen actually acutely increased the oxidative stress and inflammation during exercise, which people from exercise science know that this is potentially a good thing because you don't want to take antioxidants and anti-inflammatories in conjunction with exercise it blunts hypertrophy gains right right the h2 potentiated the stress response but they rebounded to homeostasis faster right so the the inflammation and oxidative stress came down to homeostatic levels quicker than the exercise alone group this indicates that hydrogen increased the exercise stress but decreased the recovery time you know meaning it's like you worked out harder and recovered quicker which sounds like a good idea yeah <laughs> definitely which is why a, a lot of high level athletes are now using hydrogen in their protocols uh -huh. and it's legal yeah of course i mean it's something endogenous in our, our body um you can get it from your diet there's nothing in, in the water rules or anything like that about hydrogen being a performance enhancer. We've talked about, most of us, our gut microbiome stinks, um, and we've, we're, we're starving it to death, and we're killing it. So does hydrogen water or hydrogen gas have any effect on improving the gut microbiome? Yes, so there's quite a number of studies, and actually th this is one area that, that uh, is really showing the difference between, say, drinking hydrogen water and inhaling hydrogen gas, right? So that was actually one of the first big, you know, skepticisms on hydrogen water is, why wouldn't you just inhale the gas, right? Yeah. But we're, we're showing it in, uh, say, pharmacokinetic research that even at hundreds of times higher levels, hydrogen water is having the same or even greater rise in cellular concentrations as inhaling, but it's also getting to certain areas far better than inhalation does. Like for instance, it's having a much more robust effect on the microbiome and it's getting to our liver better, right? And actually we're, we're seeing that hydrogen is a driver of liver homeostasis as well. And that, that's a whole separate topic because a, a percentage of the hydrogen that goes into the liver is actually metabolized in an unknown way. Right. Hmm. And it's showing like, you know, things like liver health are needing like 10 times the dosage of hydrogen to see an effect as compared to like exercise performance. So that's that's a different subject. But with the microbiome, specifically with hydrogen water, it's getting and it's interacting with our microbiome. And on a number of studies, 15 or 20 now um, in humans and in multiple animal models, we've seen significant improvements in the microbiome after administering hydrogen water. In addition to that. In one of our recent studies on the tablets, we saw some other, you know, parameters in gut health that improved. We significantly decreased calprotectin, and we improved short-chain short fatty acids, Ooh. most prominently uh, propionic acid and butyric acid. So uh, calprotectin, for those of you who are curious, is, is one of the measurements we can make to actually look... Um, at leaky gut, at damage to the wall of the gut. And 
So that's a big deal if you see that being modified coming down from your intervention. And if you've read any of my last three books, including Gut Check, you know that short-chain fatty acids are kind of the holy grail, not only of gut health, but also of mitochondrial health, of brain health. And if, particularly if you've read Gut Check, you know that a lot of our bacteria that make butyrate actually have to have precursors for butyrate of other short-chain fatty acids like acetate, like propionic. And so what he's saying in, in science speak is this is good stuff. Um, so, sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, there, there's also some other gut-related benefits. Um, and we've seen this in the research but uh, before this, but it was the first time we saw it in humans, that uh, hydrogen actually regulated uh, ghrelin, right? And in, in this case... That's the hunger hormone. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> But, you know, and to jump in, like, it has some really cool other roles in our body, too. Like, ghrelin is neuroprotective. Mm. It regulates our glucose metabolism. It regulates our insulin response. And uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people get confused on ghrelin because this is a hormone that you actually want to peak and drop, right? But in obese people, it just stays not even elevated, like, in healthy people with a healthy metabolism, it peaks much higher than in obese people. Obese people, it never peaks and it never drops. So this was an overweight population we did this in, yep. and it showed that the hydrogen drove peaks in ghrelin, so it started functioning normally. normally. And does it have any effect on leptin or leptin resistance or leptin sensitivity, or has that been looked at? I'm not aware of that. Okay. Now, off camera, you were telling me some interesting studies about hydrogen water and potentiating the desirable effects of certain drugs and maybe blocking some of the undesirable effects of certain drugs. Can you, can you elaborate on that? I think sure. this is interesting. Yeah, th this is actually, uh, like, I I'm an author in a lot of these papers that have been ah, coming okay. out. Um, so this is what I think is the most exciting area of research in hydrogen future. Um, we, we've shown it in multiple preclinical studies to potentiate different approved pharmaceutical agents, um, not just myself and the researchers I work for, but other teams as well. A paper at uh, Stony Brook saw a synergy between hydrogen and minocycline for post-stroke recovery in rats. We have seen hydrogen um, potentiate the effects of sulfasalazine on ulcerative colitis, right? Yeah, so okay. hydrogen was roughly as effective as sulfasalazine for you see, but the combination were more effective. All right. And then we saw hydrogen um, potentiate the effects of fluorocell or 5-FU for colorectal cancer in mice. And this was a very, very interesting paper because hydrogen and 5-FU had similar effects on reducing tumor size, tumor weight, um, and collagen content right within the tumor. As expected, um, fluorocell, the chemotherapeutic, um, it, it increased oxidative stress and blunted the antioxidant response. As expected in the hydrogen alone group, it activated our antioxidant response and reduced oxidative stress. Um, now, this is where it gets really interesting about hydrogen and its regulatory role, because 19 times out of 20 hydrogen shows in the research to have potent antioxidant-like effects, anti-inflammatory-like effects and such. But one in 20 times, like such as the exercise research I talked about, hydrogen has potentiated stress responses, like increased oxidative stress for beneficial outcomes or increased inflammation for beneficial outcomes. So in this study, hydrogen actually increased within the cancer cells, increased the oxidative stress and blunted the you know, antioxidant response in conjunction the with 5-FU more than the 5-FU alone. So it basically obliterated the cancer. So it completely nerfed the tumor size and weight and the collagen content in the, the hydrogen group and in the, the 5-FU group were like 23, 24%. It dropped to 6% in the combo group. We have some other uh, interesting research that, that we're just writing up the manuscript right now on hydrogen and, and uh, statin where we're seeing some other really interesting stuff going on i, I can't go into it All right, yeah, too I much because we haven't published but no we're, we're seeing this over and over again yeah i think you mentioned and maybe it's not published yet um 
Not that I really care, but does hydrogen lower cholesterol or change cholesterol synthesis? There is a, a systematic review and meta-analysis showing that hydrogen has uh, cholesterol improving results. But again, this is only when they're abnormal, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, and this is what's really cool about hydrogen. When, when you have a healthy population that there's nothing wrong with the marker, even if hydrogen changes that marker 19 out of 20 times, it seems to have no effect when the markers are in or a fine. healthy range because it's just driving homeostasis, right? right. And, and this is what it's doing with, say, our oxidative stress. It's not an antioxidant. It, it's driving something called redox homeostasis, which is like the yin-yang relationship between our beneficial antioxidants and our beneficial stressors, right? right. Um, People think of all free radicals and stress as bad. That's that's not a good thing. A lot of them have very critical cell signaling roles in our body. Yep. Uh, nitric oxide is a free radical, right, for yeah. instance. So hydrogen, rather than being a direct antioxidant, it is regulating our production of antioxidants in our body by the NERF2 pathway, but also regulating things like nitric oxide and H2O2. Wait a minute. So th this stuff is so good for us. Um, Shouldn't we be drinking hydrogen water all day long, every day, maybe get up in the middle of the night and have another shot? That's actually what, what a lot of companies say, but they don't understand the science and they don't read the science. Because what we know about hydrogen, just like if we're looking at hydrogen like a hormetic stress, like exercise, right? more isn't always better. This is true. You, you need a peak in stress to get the adaptation and then a recovery. Right. In research on, on uh, say, rodents, when we put a, a continuous flow of hydrogen 24-7, we actually see no improvements. It's only when we pulse and they might get hydrogen in their cage for one or two hours a day. That's when we see it. In addition, um, when, when rodents are drinking hydrogen water, they, they have mice and rats have much different feeding and drinking schedules than humans do. True. Right? They, they yeah. drink their water, and they drink like 12 times more water than, than a human does, right, per body weight. Yeah. And they drink it all within a few hours, right? So it's like they get that peak stress and then the adaptation for recovery. So you absolutely do not want to be sipping hydrogen water all day long. You want to drink it once or twice, at most three times a day, in a very short time period so that you can get it into your cells, peak your CMAX, get your cellular concentration as high as you can, and then let it drop and recover. Hear that, everybody? <laughs> All right, so here we go. The tablets are uh, a little bit exothermic, right? Yes. So they release heat is what that means. So you don't want to chew it. You don't want to swallow it either. Um, you want to drop it in the water. Okay. And basically... What hydrogen water is, all that it is, it is the water is a delivery method to get the hydrogen gas into your internal organs. So wait a minute. So that fizz, what are we seeing? So we're seeing H2. So when, when you put like traditional, you know, uh, fizzy tablet in the water, it's right. releasing CO2. Right. 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 So a lot of people get confused on what hydrogen water is, and they think it's a completely new compound, right? That's not what we're doing. This is a solution, right, of gas dissolved in water, just like sparkling water, right. which is just water with CO2. CO2. This is just water with H2. And the water part, the H2O part, isn't particularly important, except it's delivering the H2 gas to our internal organs so it can get to our liver and so it can react with our microbiome. So why doesn't the hydrogen uh, combine with the oxygen and make more water? In a, a nutshell, to go to maybe a bit too chemistry for most people, but uh, molecular hydrogen has a full outer shell, so it's very resistant to reaction. Right? But what is happening is we're using elemental magnesium to break apart the water. Right? So basically, we're getting some of the water molecules, and the H2 is splitting off, and the oxygen is combining with the magnesium to make magnesium hydroxide. So we're getting hydrogen gas plus magnesium hydroxide. But hydroxide is a function of pH, right. and we're using organic acids like malic acid, which yeah. is also part of the Krebs cycle and can help contribute to ATP. Right. Um, to, to help catalyze this reaction and, and also reduce the hydroxide, which just leaves the H2 gas in the water and Mg2+, plus, or free magnesium ions. And, and uh, don't get me started with how good magnesium is for us. 
A hundred percent. I mean, what is it? 80 or 90 percent of people are deficient yes. in, in magnesium. And one of the reasons why it can be hard to raise your magnesium levels is a lot of magnesium supplements aren't particularly bioavailable. True. And the reason for this is magnesium forms strong compounds typically. And a lot of these magnesium like uh, salts that we take as supplements, they're, they're too strong for our stomach acid to break apart, especially in older people who need them the most. So they just pass through us, you know, and, and act as a laxative. Exactly. But this reaction is leaving the magnesium in the free ion form, which is exactly what we need to utilize in our body. So your stomach doesn't have to do any work to liberate this magnesium. We're getting a one-two punch out of this. Yeah. Yeah. And I can tell you as a heart surgeon that most people are so severely depleted in magnesium that after heart surgery we had to put people on magnesium drips for 48 hours to get their magnesium levels up uh, to where they wouldn't have atrial fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia and if those sound bad you're right so you're right uh, we're most of us are really profoundly deficient in magnesium and even if your doctor tells you that your magnesium level is fine most people don't realize that we will keep our blood magnesium level in a normal range even though we've completely depleted our cellular magnesium where it really needs to be yeah. so so this has been bubbling for what a couple minutes a couple minutes yeah and looks like mine's rot risen to the surface now or about to rise to the surface yeah so i see mine up on the top what i say to people is you want to drink this as fast as possible so prepare it in the volume of water that you can most easily chug so like i chug mine like this Wow. That's pretty good. So I don't want to sip it and enjoy the savory, you know, flavor and smell. It's actually really tasty, folks. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is one of the reasons why we use different volumes of water in the research, depending on the subject population. Yeah. For instance, uh, with athletes, we will always use half a liter of water or about 17 ounces. Okay. For middle-aged, you know, um, people would say things like metabolic syndrome. Yeah. We're often using about 12 ounces of water instead of 17 because they tend to be able to drink that quickly. Yeah. But uh, in the one study we did on a 70-plus population, the average age was 77, we used 8 ounces of water. And? And, well, we saw some remarkable benefits in that population. So... This was uh, six months long, double blind, placebo controlled, and uh, we, we, I think, raised uh, telomeres by, I think it was 14%. We lengthened them where they went down in, in uh, the placebo group, of course, as you'd expect. Um, we uh, improved DNA methylation. We improved brain metabolism in the elderly. Uh, we doubled this uh, protein in the blood called TET2, T-E-T-2. T -E -T mm -hmm. Now, for anyone uh, watching who has... Uh, seen uh, the headlines on the vampire research where yeah. they take the blood of a young mouse Ooh, and yeah. they put it into the older mouse and it, it improves their brain function and also their skeletal tissue. Right. Um, this is linked to TET2. So TET2 actually has very critical roles in muscle regeneration. Now These, we're not talking about getting a tattoo. No, no, okay. no. T-E-T-2. -T so TET2. In addition to this, we saw some real functional benefits that affect people's everyday life. So in the hydrogen group, it, it tended to improve sleep, it improved quality of life scores by reducing pain scores, but very importantly, and this could be linked to the TET2 rise, uh, we improved some parameters of the senior fitness test. So for instance, the sit chair stand. Oh, yeah. So elderly people, they could sit and stand more times before they got tired. And this was actually kind of shocking because with the average age of 77 over six months, you don't expect that to improve. True. And in addition to that, this was recruited in early 2020 during the lockdowns of the pandemic. Wow. So these people weren't going to the gym. They weren't out walking or anything. Yeah. They were stuck in their homes, and yet the hydrogen group still got more fit. All right. So this is patented, yes? 
Yes, sir. Okay. Why don't I go to the grocery store and buy a hydrogen water in a plastic uh, container, which I've seen? Um, what do you think? The hydrogen water, like ready to drinks, right? That like cans you open. One plastic is only going to keep hydrogen in it for a couple hours, right? So um, hydrogen, as you said at the start of the interview, it's the smallest molecule in the universe, right? It does not get smaller, so it can pass through any container. Right, uh, even the ones in aluminum pouches, most of them can't actually be certified by the IHSA, International Hydrogen Standards Association, as being called hydrogen water wow. because they're below the lowest concentration that's ever seen any physiological effect on the body. And, Darn! And often, even in these aluminum pouches, because the aluminum pouches, they have plastic caps on them. Good point. What's the point in that? And, and like they might get packaged at like one milligram a liter or one ppm of H2, but by the time they get over here from Japan or Korea or China, they're down to 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And, and then you're getting a super low dose as well because they're usually in 200 milliliter pouches. Yeah. So the concentration is low and then the volume of water is low. So what did we just have? That was about 500 milliliters because yeah. we put two tablets in there. Um, our gas chromatography shows that a single tablet in 500 milliliters or 17 ounces is over 12 ppm, right? Oh. But because we put two, it's not going to be a doubling effect. It's going to be about time and a half. So we would have gotten 17 or 18 ppm in half a liter. So we were getting close to nine milligrams of H2. Whereas if you're even at 0.5 ppm, which those pouches don't get, in 200 milliliters of water, that's only 0.1 milligram of H2. So we're getting 90 times more in that glass we just drank than one of the pouches that you're going to buy for 4 or $5 at the grocery store. Cool. Now, the other thing, maybe, we, maybe people don't realize, people drink a fizzy beverage or a carbonated beverage and a great number of people then belch. <laughs> yeah. um, this stuff, hydrogen, like you mentioned, is the smallest molecule in the world. And it literally goes right through the wall of our gut into our bloodstream. Yes? Some of it does. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, some of it... Uh, feeds uh, our uh, microbiome. Yeah, exactly. So some will start just like you know, diffusing straight through the wall of our stomach into our body. Whereas a, a good chunk we're actually discovering is going through the, the typical chain through our intestines and then through our liver and then passing through to our heart, right? So we, we know we are getting a good percentage that's going through that way, but hydrogen will, will go throughout all of our body by transferring from being in the water to dissolving in our blood. Yeah. And our blood just carries it everywhere. Right. If you found this video helpful, I think you're gonna love this one. The more you introduce your kids to this style of eating early on, you're gonna set them up for a much healthier lifespan to come.